further ado, ado, we're excited to bring you this webinar today. With us today are two experts in their respective fields. First off is Dr. Sandeep Mystery of NAU Urology Specialists. Dr. Mystery is a Texas native, having grown up in the Houston suburb of Sugarland. He received his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine. While a medical student, he was awarded a prestigious Howard Hughes Research Fellowship to conduct basic science research in prostate cancer. Dr. Mystery played a critical role in the development of the Da Vinci Robot Prostatectomy Program at Baylor at a time when very few systems were available around the world. We also have Dr. David Wood of Advantage IR. For 16 years, Dr. Wood has specialized in microinvasive targeted treatments for a variety of health problems guided by state-of-the-art imaging technologies. Dr. Wood obtained his medical doctorate degree from the University of Southern California. He stayed on at USC for specialty training in diagnostic radiology, followed by a subspecialty training in interventional radiology. He is double board certified in diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology. For 11 years, Dr. Wood served as chief of, chief of interventional radiology at Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. For the past two years, Dr. Wood has been the medical director of Advantage IR. We welcome everybody. We welcome our doctors. Dr. Mystery, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Mystery. Um, I don't know how many of you can see me, but uh, if you can, uh, then, uh, well, you're lucky then. Um, <laughs> most of you are uh, uh, patients of mine uh, or one of the partners here at the practice. Uh, for those of you that uh, like to learn more about what we offer here, uh, please make sure you tune into our radio show on 590 News Radio KLBJ every Saturday from three to four. There's also a podcast that's become increasingly popular. Uh, it's the way that I validate myself, so please download it and listen to it uh, because it's a, uh, it's a wonderful information source and also one that allows us to um, uh, get a lot of feedback uh, and answer questions that you might otherwise feel somewhat reticent to answer. So um, if you are a patient of mine uh, and you have been treated for BPH, you may have been given some information on prostate artery embolization. You may not have. This is a, a very unique opportunity. There is um, so much that has evolved in terms of the treatment for BPH over the last several years. Uh, when I finished residency, there was only one treatment. That was 13 years ago. And in the last 13 years, we've come up with multiple different ways to treat urinary complaints. And each treatment each person's prostate, each situation is somewhat unique. And so uh, I thought that um, our, our, our newest kind of uh, exploration into, a, into cutting edge technology, we should find a way of reaching patients that have had BPH symptoms, maybe are on medicines, or maybe even patients who we've asked to try a certain type of treatment. And uh, I guess, you know, sometimes we have patients that just don't want to do anything. And so really being able to uh, um, share this is uh, something really great for us. So um, most of you are fully aware of what kind of symptoms uh, BPH um, causes. Uh, but if, uh, as a small reminder, an enlarged prostate can lead to two different categories of symptoms, obstructive symptoms and irritative symptoms. The obstructive symptoms usually lead to a, low, a slow flow, incomplete emptying, if it really doesn't empty, you'll, you'll get urinary tract infections or bladder stones, and some men report a delay to start. We also call that hesitancy. Now, irritative symptoms are usually because the bladder is becoming somewhat damaged because it has to push past this blocked prostate. And symptoms of irritative voiding include urgency, which means that you have a very small wait time to go to the bathroom, frequency, which means that you're going to the bathroom very frequently, like every... Um, uh, every couple of hours, incontinence, usually urgent continence where you can't hold it long enough before you get to the bathroom, nighttime urination. In our practice, usually two or more times we consider to be excessive nighttime urination, and in some cases even bleeding uh, from the prostate gland. So uh, although I won't go too much into each particular one, these are all the different types of traditional BPH treatment options that we perform 
that are urology led. So all of these things have various pros and cons. They um, often can be performed either in the office or in an operating room session. Uh, they've been around for various times. The, uh, the top ones are the more uh, recently released ones. More, um, they're more in vogue right now. The ones towards the end have been around for much longer periods of time. Um, and more urologists are familiar with each one of them. So although I'm not going to uh, go deeply, deeply into each one, I did want to just actually just mention what each one kind of generally entails so that when you hear ads or see information on it, uh, you'll know what we're talking about. So when it comes to medications, uh, many of you may be on medications already, Flomax, Alfusacin, Rapaflow. These medicines open up the prostate gland, allow it to relax, and they work very well. However, they can have side effects when they're used for the long term. Uh, fatigue is one of them. It can cause the sexual side effect of retrograde ejaculation, and it can cause dizziness. The next two, finasteride and dutasteride, are medicines that actually shrink the prostate, whereas the other ones don't. These actually shrink the prostate. However, they have sexual side effects because they affect how the hormones in the prostate are being processed. And then some patients we put on Tadalafil or daily Cialis, which can help urinary symptoms, but also does not reduce the size of the prostate and generally does not reduce or improve the urine flow. So some of the pros uh, uh, are that they work, but some of the cons are that, um, that, that they, they uh, um, that, uh, well, I guess this slide doesn't look that great. I'm sorry about that. Some of the cons, of course, as I mentioned, are the uh, problems with dizziness and retrograde ejaculation. The Urolift procedure, if we've explained it or you've seen a presentation before, uses small titanium clips attached to a string that work essentially like a curtain hanger to pull the prostate lobes apart and allow for the urine to come out. The pros for this procedure is that it's simple and quick. It's done in the office. Uh, although I put a catheter in patients overnight to reduce the likelihood of complications, other surgeons may not do that. It can be done in the office, although I do it in the operating room because I think I do a better job, but some of my partners do put it in the, in the office, and it does not cause retrograde ejaculation. However, it doesn't reduce the size of the prostate, and this procedure is very dependent on the skill of the surgeon. So if, if you go to somebody that doesn't do a lot, it may not turn out uh, as well. And I would say that... Um, that uh, over uh, the gold standard, it works about 70% uh, of the time. The resume procedure is, um, if anybody's heard of the hot steam treatment, this is a treatment that we do in the office. We use a, a little device that injects uh, um, superheated water or, or, or hot steam into the prostate. And what that does is it causes an involution or a shrinking type um, uh, uh, effect where the prostate gets smaller. And that process takes several weeks, but then the, the urethra becomes less obstructed. It's quick and easy, it's in office, It'll, it will reduce the size of the prostate, but it does require a catheter for at least a week and some patients can have prolonged urgency symptoms afterwards. So it's better for those patients with predominantly obstructive symptoms. So if your, your flow is slow, this is great. If you're getting up 10 times a night to pee, this may make it worse. So I, it's not usually something I'll, I'll um, uh, um, steer you towards. The aquablate is really, really cool to watch on video, uh, but because it uses a like a water knife put into the bladder to cut away the prostate tissue. Um, I, I have not done aquablate uh, because although I think it sounds really good and looks really cool on videos, I'd be a little afraid to have it done to my own prostate. The benefit to it, it's cutting edge, it's good for large prostates, um, it's quick, it is, however, done in the operating room. Uh, there is no heat or radiation with this particular one, and it's not covered by some insurance. So I think that has greatly limited uh, its utility. The TERP, for those of you in the audience that have gotten a TERP by me, you know, uh, you know what, we're, what we're talking about. I usually refer to it as the gold standard. It does reduce the size of the prostate. Everybody can do it. It does, however, require general anesthetic. You do have to have a catheter afterwards. Um, that catheter can stay in for up to uh, a week in our office. You will get retrograde ejaculation. So when you uh, orgasm, there will be no fluid coming out and there's a potential bleeding risk. Green light laser, that's one of those uh, 
previous generation fad therapies in which we uh, use like a laser beam to uh, take out some of the prostate. Some of you in the audience may have had a green light laser in the past. It does, uh, it does minimize bleeding risk and it works for small to moderate sized prostates. And there is a catheter requirement usually for three days. It doesn't work well if you have urgency symptoms. So again, if you're going to the bathroom very urgently or have lots of urinary frequency, the green light energy, in my experience, does lead to increased amounts of frequency. And it's just not as commonly performed anymore. And it's because the green light itself is not as widely available as it once was. But um, it certainly is available in our practice. And if you're interested, that's something that we can continue to do. The homium laser enucleation just uses a different type of laser to take away prostate tissue. Um, and the laparoscopic simple prostatectomy has been the standard of care of what I do for very, very large prostates, and I've done that in the past. Mm -hmm. But what's happened um, is that many of you out there didn't like any of them. I, you know, <laughs> seven or eight choices, either that was too many or you didn't like any of them. And it was either because uh, you felt that the procedures were too invasive or that you didn't want to have any, anything in your penis or you didn't want to go to the hospital or you were afraid of sexual side effects. So um, understanding that, we have become increasingly interested in offering and partnering with um, uh, physicians that can provide prostate artery embolization. You know, going back to the same kind of format of describing other ones, and Dr. Wood's going to explain what the procedure is here uh, briefly. But for our patients, when we're explaining it, it's minimally invasive, which means that there's no uh, large incisions. There's no catheter afterwards. There's a minimal recovery. Many patients can get back to normal activities very quickly. Excellent clinical outcomes that Dr. Wood is going to go over. It can be performed on a wide range of prostate sizes, specifically very large prostates lack of sexual side effects, and does not preclude anything. So if it doesn't work, we can do any, anything that already listed, we can still do. So it doesn't burn any bridges. And I, I love keeping my options open. Another area where prostate artery embolization is playing a huge role is those patients who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer that want to undergo high intensity focused ultrasound, which is a minimally invasive way that we treat prostate cancer. So by reducing the size of the prostate, more prostates become eligible for this type of advanced prostate cancer care. And so um, uh, being able to reduce the size of the prostate without any more additional invasive procedures really appeals to a lot of patients. So why have you not heard of prostate artery embolization? Well, although um, I would say that I've heard of this, this procedure and this treatment for uh, over 15 years, um, it's only more recently that uh, organizations have gotten into the quote unquote, the business of doing PAE. Otherwise you'd have to go to a hospital and get it done by uh, perhaps an interventional radiologist that doesn't do many. But the number one reason you haven't heard about it is because if you're going to a urologist to get your prostate treated and that urologist doesn't do that, then you're not gonna get recommended to do that. And so uh, I can tell you from personal anecdote that all throughout my training, the notion of using prostate artery embolization has been uh, largely uh, downplayed, but I think it's a lot uh, having to do with what we call turf wars in medicine, where you know one doctor may not want to give up the business to another doctor. And uh, if you've been a patient of mine, I hope you come away knowing that I really want what's best for you, whether or not it's my hands on it or not. And so, uh, really introducing this technology to you guys uh, for that purpose um, uh, is, is really important to me. And so um, what I'd like to do is uh, throw this over to Dr. Wood, and uh, please keep your questions coming, even if it's not directly about PAE, we'll, we'll get to it, and that's what we're here for, okay? Dr. Mystery, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Dr. Please. Mystery, I have, a, I have a question for you, Dr. Mystery. I have a, I'm going to talk about a patient who has a 200-gram prostate. What kinds of options would be open for him after seeing your presentation, maybe, maybe just a simple prostatectomy? At That's that right. In, in my hands, because of my expertise with robotic surgery, uh, and, and no small part because the surgery is very enjoyable to me, uh, I will usually recommend a laparoscopic simple prostatectomy. Uh, it is done uh, similar to how a radical prostatectomy is performed, uh, but it is uh, done um, around, uh, what we do is we laparoscopically access the abdomen, then we cut into the bladder and access the prostate. 
and then we core out the prostate similar to how you would core out an orange. You leave the peel behind, you take the fruit out, and this works exceptionally well for large prostates. It does not interfere with continence or with potency, so people remain continent and are able to uh, still have erections. Uh, but um, you know, if you've had previous abdominal surgery, it's not a great option. Recently, I was unable to do it because of a patient with a history of bladder cancer, and I didn't feel comfortable opening up his bladder to the rest of his abdominal contents. But you know, now uh, with you, uh, David, we're able to really offer something that is a lot less invasive uh, and, and does really well. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm going to bring up my, actually, I'm going to bring up my presentation. How's that? Great. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to tell you about a patient, a patient that came to me. I, I like to just kind of start out by uh, telling a patient's story. This is a patient that came to me early in my experience with embolization. By the way, embolization means slowing down, markedly slowing down or stopping blood flow. And it's done by using tools inside that we place inside the blood vessel. It can be done in an artery or a vein. In this case, we're going to be talking about embolizing or slowing way down the blood flow in the prostate arteries using endovascular tools or tools that we place inside the vessels. So let's talk about this patient that came to me as a retired orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and he had been battling BPH symptoms or what we call low, lower urinary tract symptoms for several years. He had a 200 gram prostate, uh, as I told Dr. Mystery, and uh, that's very large. He had been trying to control his symptoms with medications uh, and was not considering surgery. Uh, so he was uh, kind of struggling along with medications. What you see on the screen is his IPSS score. This is a symptom score that's used all over the world to kind of score the severity of lower urinary tract symptoms. And uh, so seven questions are asked on this form. Patients fill out this form themselves and they give themselves a score of zero to five. And then you add up the score. So this patient's score was 23. And you can see that that puts him in the severe range of urinary tract symptoms. And that this last question is a quality of life question. How satisfied were you to continue on the rest of your life this way? And he answered mostly dissatisfied. So these are all the, the usual urinary, urinary tract symptoms that are caused by BPH. These symptoms can have other causes, but there's, a, there's actually a list of causes for these symptoms. BPH is probably the most common cause uh, but there are other causes that need to be ruled out by a urology workup. So let's, uh, let's just say that this patient had the workup done. He actually had an MRI done, which I don't usually do, but I have pictures from his MRI. He happened to have an MRI ordered by uh, a urologist who I imagine the patient had a very high PSA because of the size of his prostate. And so he had an MRI done to make sure that there wasn't anything to be concerned about in the prostate. So this is this patient's MRI, uh, and we're looking on this view here on the left, we're looking at his body from the side. So this is his front, his stomach, and this is his back. His sacrum bones are seen here. So this is his prostate right here. You can see compared to a normal prostate on this side, this is not that patient, this is a, uh, another picture that I found of a normal prostate kind of at the same scale. So you can see how much enlarged this patient's prostate is. It's growing up into the bladder, compressing the bladder, and it's interfering with the bladder's ability to fill completely. And I think I have a cross-sectional view of that here. So now we're looking at a cross-section through the pelvis. This is my patient's prostate. It was 200 grams. And this is a normal prostate. So you can see how much bigger that is. And the problem is the urethra needs to travel right through the prostate. And you can imagine that when the urethra is getting squeezed shut, that uh, it's going to obstruct the flow of urine. The urethra drains urine from the bladder to the outside. And when the prostate grows around the urethra, it will squeeze the urethra shut, making it difficult to drain your urine. And that was the case for this patient. Uh, difficulty starting urination, a weak stream, 
Um, and when your urethra gets obstructed, you cannot completely empty the bladder. Well, if you can't completely empty the bladder, then it's not going to take long before your bladder feels full again, which leads to the incre increased frequency. And frequency at night uh, means nocturia, or getting up at night uh, to urinate. So all, all normal common symptoms of BPH. Um, with frequency comes anxiety. My patient certainly had this. He had a home in Oregon and a home in Arizona, and he liked to travel back and forth. But as you can imagine, long car rides are one of the first things that patients with this condition uh, start to avoid. And that interfered with time with his grandchildren, uh, time playing golf, and just living life the way he wanted to live it. He was no longer living on his own terms, but his life was becoming ruled by his urinary symptoms. So what do I do? I approach organs. This is in my job. I approach organs through the blood vessels and I can influence the function and size of organs uh, by approaching the organ through its blood vessels and injecting various uh, kinds of therapies to influence that organ the way we need to. And in this case, we know from uh, going way back through decades of embolization technology, we know that if we slow down the blood flow into an organ through its arteries, slow down the arterial blood, and our arterial blood brings oxygen and nutrients to our body, to our body parts, to our organs, veins drain the blood back to the heart to get new oxygen. So if we slow down the blood flow in arteries into an organ, that organ will shrink. We've known that for many, many years. So, uh, so it be, started to become apparent that when the blood flow into the prostate is slowed down, the prostate will shrink. And that was found long ago, what Dr. Mystery mentioned prostate artery embolization being around 15 years, when its first use was for patients that were bleeding, especially uh, bleeding after prostate surgery. And uh, that's a, an uncommon complication, but it can be severe. It can lead to severe bleeding. And uh, doctors like me have gone in using endovascular tools to find the bleeding blood vessel and close it or embolization. And they found in doing so that this could make the prostate shrink as well. Uh, and so it began to be considered and studied as a standalone treatment for treating BPH using our technology to embolize and thus shrink the prostate and relieve the obstructive symptoms. Uh, so what, I, what we need to do is get into the prostate artery with a tiny catheter. So imagine an angel hair pasta that is long and steerable and that uh, we can steer in the, wherever we want in the body and we watch where we're going uh, using x-ray, real-time x-ray. And so this cartoon on the left is meant to show that all of the body's arteries are connected. And so if we enter an artery somewhere, anywhere, we can get to any other artery in the body. I can go to the arteries, to the intestines, the ribs, the legs. I can go up to the, uh, the lungs, the brain, and the, the spleen. We, so we do procedures in pretty much every organ. And, and we're happy to now offer a procedure for the prostate. So by entering the body right here at the femoral artery at the top of the leg, we enter these, look at these red vessels, these are the arteries. We enter the artery there and we can navigate our way up through the arteries and down into the pelvis. Now these arteries here are, are just meant to show the branches into the pelvic organs and those will become important. That's gonna be our route. So this cartoon, is showing that we need to enter the femoral artery and navigate our little tools into the prostate artery. How do we do this? It's a minor procedure. It's all endovascular. The only place I touch you is at the groin to put my catheter in that artery. So we don't just, just get it out of the way. We don't touch the penis. We don't touch the rectum or anything else. There, and we don't place the catheter. Uh, this is a minor procedure. It takes about two hours. Uh, we do give the patient mild sedatives, so it's not general anesthesia. You're still breathing on your own. And then after we're done with the procedure, we watch you for, for about 90 minutes and they'll let, let you go home. Uh, so let's follow this patient's procedure. My patient, my retired orthopedic surgeon, 
uh, with the 200 gram prostate, he decided to undergo embolization. And so I have entered his femoral artery, went up to the aorta and then down into the pelvic arteries. These are his pictures from his procedures. So I've sent the catheter up and then back down and we're in his pelvic arteries here. Now the black that we're seeing here is contrast dye that we inject to see the arteries and see where we're going. Uh, you can barely see some bones on here to let you know that this is an x-ray picture. The computer largely subtracts out the bones so that all we see are the arteries. So this is one of the arteries to several of his pelvic organs and this is the left prostatic artery. So we've gotten to here at this point with our catheters. We need to further send our catheter deeper into the prostate artery and here we've done that. So you, maybe you can see that there's a tiny, here's my angel hair pasta catheter that I've navigated into the left prostatic artery. Got a little corkscrew shape here, that's no problem. And we inject contrast dye. And now we're seeing the kind of blush of contrast in the capillaries of the prostate. And this is the same patient's MRI, a coronal view or a front facing view that shows we're looking at the left hemiprostate and we've got that capillary blush conforming nicely to the shape of the prostate that we see on the MRI. So we treat half the prostate. The prostate's one gland, but it's got a left and a right, and uh, so we treat half the prostate from the left prostatic artery and the right half from the right prostatic artery. So we are in the left prostatic artery. We are ready to administer our prostate shrinking treatment and so what are we gonna do? Well, to kind of describe what we do next, um, I'd like to show you a common thing that we see in Arizona. Uh, I'm from Arizona, and you see this in a lot of people's backyards. You see what we call a wash uh, lined with round, smooth, round stones. And they're, they're pretty, but they're also functional. They're meant to slow down the energy and velocity of moving water. We get some heavy rains in Arizona, though it's the desert. When it does rain, it rains hard. These are meant to kind of manage the flooding that can occur in one's yard, uh, along with the stones that slows down the energy of the moving water. We do the same thing in blood vessels. We, our objective in treating the prostate is to line the prostate arteries with these smooth little round stones. They're not stones, these are actually gelatin beads that we use in the prostate artery, but it's the same idea. We are injecting a uh, space occupying uh, microsphere that it is meant to uh, stay in the artery and slow down the velocity and energy of the arterial blood flow into the prostate. That's uh, the whole idea. Now companies make these microspheres uh, in various sizes. Here's a syringe of 700 micron or a point seven, seven tenths of a millimeter is, is 700 microns. We actually use about 300 micron particles in the prostate um, and we use different sizes in different organs. The prostate uh, is best to use around 300 to 500 microns. These microspheres are a, a gelatin hybrid made in the lab. Uh, they're carefully calibrated to the right size. And they actually, this picture is meant to show that they actually float in fluid. They can just kind of float and dance and suspend. And that's what they do in the blood as well. So they don't just settle to the, to the bottom of the blood vessel. They actually float in the blood vessel and they go wherever the blood is flowing. So it's the flowing blood that carries the microspheres into the prostate. And so we inject, <clears throat> Uh, with a syringe, once our catheter is in the prostate artery, we take a syringe of beads and we inject, we're actually injecting hundreds of thousands of beads and we, we do not also puncture the left femoral artery. So that part of this video is incorrect, but the beads do get into the arteries. The blood flow takes them deep into the prostate. They meet a vessel size that they cannot pass through and they stop, they get stuck. So one common question I get, can the beads go through and go to my brain or my lungs or somewhere else that we don't want them? The answer is really no. Uh, 
the beads are way too big to pass through the capillaries of the prostate. And so it's really anatomically impossible for the beads to leave the prostate and go somewhere uh, we don't want them. With one exception, uh, we need, do need to be careful about little connections that there can be to the artery of the penis. Um, but for the most part, the beads stay in the prostate and there's no concern about them going to the brain or the heart or the lungs. Uh, so the beads get stuck and you can imagine how if we inject enough of them, they will start to form that column like the Arizona backyard wash. So now we've done that on the left side. We put our catheter in the left prostate artery and we've injected our beads and now we're gonna go in from that same right groin puncture, we can go into the right prostate artery and I've shown this on our patient. This is the prostatic artery winding corkscrew on its way down to the prostate. We send our micro catheter into it and inject contrast and we get again that nice right hemiprostate view to confirm that we're in the right place and we inject the beads there so that's really all there is to it this is these are after pictures so after we've injected the beads we leave an open flow in the main prostate artery it's really just those branches inside the prostate those micro arterioles inside the prostate that are now not filling with contrast dyes so here's a before and after the main prostate artery is still open. The arteries inside the prostate are closed. Here's a before and after on the left. And at this point, we are done um, with the procedure. And we watch the patient. We close that hole in the artery. We watch the patient about 90 minutes and let you go home. And over the course of seven days, that prostate uh, shrinks. It starts shrinking right away. And by the end, of, it's a, it takes about seven days. But by the end of seven days, the patient is already feeling their improvement. So that, and there can be side effects. Uh, we we uh, can cause uh, some uh, pain with urination. Um, some uh, urinary urgency can get worse afterwards. Uh, we have done, uh, and that those side effects last for about a week. Now, MRI studies have been done to see what kind of effect we're having on the prostate you may wonder, why doesn't this kill the prostate if I'm cutting off its blood flow? That's a good question. This would, this would cause uh, serious damage to some organs like the kidney, the heart, and the brain. The prostate is not as sensitive to ischemia. So MRI studies have been done to look before and after. So this was not my patient, but this is from a study. This, this was the, the same patient before and after embolization you can see that the prostate has shrunk quite a bit in size, and there are little cystic spaces in the prostate that are probably little areas of necrosis or little, little dead areas inside the prostate. But for the most part, the prostate is still intact and very much alive, and the prostate keeps doing its job. The prostate is a sexual organ. Its job is to store semen, and it keeps doing that. And there doesn't seem to be uh, any effect on the prostate's ability to do its job. Uh, so the treatment does not kill the prostate, but it does make it shrink, which is exactly what we want. So for my patient, the patient we've been talking about, he came in six weeks later and he filled out this form and he came up with a score of seven. So his score, here's his baseline, had gone from 23 down to seven. So his IPSS score dropped about 16 points and his quality of life score went from four to zero and zero is good. Zero is delighted, which is what we want. So that, this is most important is that the patient is happy with their symptoms. He, he still has a score of seven. His score didn't go to zero, which would be ideal, of course, um, but we're never really able to get to zero. I don't, I'm not sure that any treatment, even surgery can get you to zero. Uh, but what we want to do is drop the score enough to make the patient uh, feel satisfied with their results. And often that will mean uh, a drop of about 15 points. Uh, so this, this is not an extreme result. This is a typical result. Uh, getting a drop of 16 points is um, what we would expect for an average patient. Um, so how well does it work? 
how it worked really well for this patient, but how well does it work in clinical studies? Well, lots of randomized studies have been done. There have been three big ones that actually took patients and randomized them to either embolization or TERP. TERP is the standard kind of traditional standard of care surgical treatment for the, the BPH that Dr. Mystery talked about. And so studies have been done that compared PAE with TERP, randomized patients to one or the other, and then compared their outcomes. So I'm going to talk about this most recent one. This study was published or earlier this year. So this is the most recent, and I'm going to show the results from that study. So remember that IPSS score, that symptom score, our patient went from 23 to 7. In this study, the patients went from uh, around 26 down to under 10. So they had r actually really big IPSS drops in this study uh, in both the PAE group, which is in blue, and the TERP group, which is in pink. Uh, they had about 20 point drop on average. And uh, that was for both treatments. There was actually no significant difference between the two treatments in the level of drop you were able to get. So um, using a minimally invasive outpatient treatment, we were able to virtually match the symptom relief that even a TERP could bring. Uh, but we were able to do this with no bladder catheter, no sexual side effects, and no time in the hospital. Um, let's look at flow rate in, this pa in these patients in this study. Qmax is the maximum flow rate of urination, and that's measured in cc's per second. Uh, so at, at baseline, uh, we uh, define a abnormally low flow rate by under 10. You can see these patients had around five cc's per second, which would be a very slow flow or a weak stream. And th those flow rates improved in both groups, PAE and TERP. So the, uh, it, usually in studies show that TERP gives you a little bit better of a flow rate improvement. Um, and that quality of life measure at the bottom of that IPSS score, remember that scale of zero to six, that quality of life measure, um, both treatments, PAE and TERP, drop uh, the score or improve the quality of life, uh, though the PAE group was significantly better. So this was a statistically significant difference between PAE and TERP in improving quality of life. And that was probably largely related to uh, PAE being better able to get patients back to normal life faster with fewer complications and side effects. Um, and speaking of side effects and complications, there were significantly fewer minor complications in the PAE group compared with the surgical TERP group. Um, other side effects were uh, un uncommon in both groups. Um, TERP is better at reducing prostate volume. And uh, other studies have shown that. Uh, so PAE does drop volume about 30%, 20 to 30%. Uh, it's especially good at reducing volume around the urethra, which is the most important uh, space. But of course, if you're cutting out prostate tissue you're, uh, in a TERP surgery, you're going to be uh, also very effective at reducing prostate volume. Um, of course, the symptom reduction is the most important symptom that uh, we look at. And uh, so, uh, as we saw before, the uh, PAE and TERP can both drop the symptom score. TERP is probably a little bit better at reducing the PSA. That's probably uh, related to the uh, drop in the prostate volume. Uh, so that's all I have for you. We'd be happy to field questions or comments. And I want to thank Dr. Mystery for um, doing this uh, webinar with me. I'd like to thank him for all his uh, support and uh, love to hear any questions that come up. Great, well, thank you, Dr. Mystery and Dr. Wood. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to call for an appointment, you have both of the numbers on the screen there. Dr. Wood, we did actually have a question, and that was in regards to pain. Is this procedure painful, or is there pain associated with this? Right. There are the, there's no um, outright pain, but there can be some discomfort when urinating. And 
Uh, that can last for a few days, even up to a week. I have found that the larger the prostate, the more uh, discomfort that comes with urinating. Uh, we have a term for that, it's called dysuria. Uh, so discomfort while urinating. We give medications to try to stay comfortable uh, through that side effect, but that is a common side effect that we expect. It, it should be on the mild side, and we are able to uh, keep patients comfortable through that. Great. Um, this is a question that maybe is more for Dr. Mystery. The question is, is there a long-term effect of darfenicin? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but... That's a great question. Uh, so uh, darfenicin is um, uh, a medication also known as Enablex. This is a medication commonly used for overactive bladder symptoms. These overactive bladder symptoms uh, are going to be urgency, frequency, nighttime peeing, and the majority of men are going to have um, overactive bladder symptoms from an enlarged prostate. <clears throat> now, in the short and long term, these medications can cause slowing of the gut, uh, so it can cause constipation, it can cause dry mouth, uh, it can cause some cognitive issues. So as people get older, and uh, and I got to see the name of the person that asked that question, so uh, I know him very well, and he's a great friend of mine and he is getting older nowadays. So uh, as you get older, these types of medicines certainly can um, uh, increase uh, cognitive side effects uh, and can cause some dizziness. So we actually don't start these in, in people over the age of 70, specifically to avoid these complications. Uh, the conic dry mouth, the conic constipation can lead to hemorrhoids uh, and of course to uh, other dental problems. So in terms of long-term side effects, that's what I would say. Great question. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Wood, there was a question in regards to insurance. Is this procedure covered by insurance? That's a great question. It is covered by most insurance. Uh, in fact, all insurance except Aetna. We have had some trouble with Aetna, uh, but they are an outlier at this point. The procedure's been commercially available for about 18 months now, uh, and that means covered by commercial insurance and uh, Medicare. Uh, we also, uh, just to piggyback on that question, I can tell you that we use FDA-approved products for use in the prostate arteries. So um, we have FDA-approved devices. We have Medicare-covered and commercially insurance-covered procedures. The procedure has been around for at least 10 years. It has been studied extensively for many, many years, but previously, previous to the last 18 months was only available in clinical trials. Yes, and our insurance specialist can work with you to get you a more precise quote in regards to your insurance and um, if there's any deductible uh, that's available to you. Uh, okay, so there's another, actually a couple questions uh, in regards to how often were complications reported beyond one week and how often did the particles migrate to the penis? Yes, <clears throat> in the study that I showed you, uh, there were no penile complications. Um, so other studies have shown uh, complications in the penis. So what can happen is there can be microscopic connections between the prostate artery and the penile artery. And we know better now how to see those and avoid those connections. Um, but uh, early on in the experience of uh, the uh, researchers, uh, those connections were not recognized and some beads got into the circulation to the penis. Uh, if, when that happens, it can cause a sore to develop at the tip of the penis uh, or what we call an ulcer or an uh, open wound in the skin at the tip of the penis. And you know, that could be uh, five to 10 millimeters across and take several weeks to heal. So that is, that is probably the worst case scenario complication that can happen from this. Of course, uh, things I can't even imagine can happen with any procedure or surgery, but uh, the, the worst case scenario is probably an ulcer at the tip of the penis. When the, it's not permanent, those do heal. They can take several weeks to heal, and it can mean, you know, it's a new medical problem that needs treatment. You'd have to uh, go to a wound care center and um, receive uh, medicated uh, ointments to put on it, dressing changes. Uh, and the incidence in studies is, is a less than 1%. 
So I would say the studies show less than 1% up to 1%. It should be very, very rare. Great, thank you. Um, one question was, they are in, uh, and this is more for Dr. Mystery, I believe, um, they are an NAU patient. Um, should they go through NAU for the analysis of applicability for this? What would you recommend? Sure, so we are uh, exceptional partners uh, uh, with Advantage IR, but they're not urologists. They're not gonna be able to do the evaluation that we like to see prior to applicability for PAE. For patients that are gonna, uh, that are gonna go for any urologic prostate procedure, you should have a cystoscopy, which is a camera in the bladder to make sure that there's no other cause of the problem. And we'd like to do an ultrasound of the prostate to know the size, because if you have a very small prostate, my experience is that um, you may be better off with a different kind of procedure. So uh, if, you, um, if you are one of our patients, we can do that in our office, and soon we will be able to offer that in the Advantage IR office. So either way, either way, either call you know, your doctor here and we'll take care of you or call Advantage IR and we'll get you taken care of over there. We're trying to make patients that are particularly interested in having this done uh, have the lowest barrier to getting it done. Great, thank you. Another question was, and this is for Dr. Wood, is there an age limit for doing the PAE? How about for somebody over 80 years old? There is not an age limit, no. And in fact, we are able uh, to treat all kinds of ages and even comorbidities. So we don't, we don't have some of the limitations that surgery could have if a patient was you know, over a certain BMI or even age. And I don't think any surgery has a true age limit. You know, we, we do look at the health of the patient. There's a very healthy 80 year old and there's unhealthy. And um, so we would take the overall health, but, if, but I'll tell you if the patient has um, good heart and lungs and they're able to walk into our office and meet us, then they are a candidate, an absolute candidate uh, as far as the safety of the procedure goes, they are ab absolutely are a candidate to undergo the procedure. Fantastic. Well, that concludes all the questions that we've received. Just a reminder to everybody, or just to let everybody know, we, are, we have been recording this session. We will send it out to everybody that was on this call, so we have the ability to go, be, go back and look at it. Uh, again, we'd like to thank Dr. Mystery. We'd like to thank Dr. Wood for your time today. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Have a great day, and hopefully we'll see you in our offices sometime in the future. Take care. Thank you.